coming up on the September 3rd edition of Carolina Week. Construction is everywhere, taking up sidewalks and roads. So where is it safe to walk to class? We'll let you know. And traffic's building up around I-40, even before you get on the highway. If the police can't catch you running through red lights in Chapel Hill, something else just might. All that and more. Carolina Week starts now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Good evening, I'm Andrea McAfee. And I'm Courtney Robinson. Thanks for joining us for the tw September 23rd edition of Carolina Week. Our top story tonight. We all know the hassles caused by construction on campus, but what incoming freshmen might not know are important rules that could save your life. Lauren Cox has that story. Major construction on Raleigh Street and Stadium Drive is underway, and just in time for the start of a new school year. For many students, this means the inconveniences of longer walks to class and less sleep. I think it probably adds at least another two to three minutes, my walk with all the uh, constructions, the sidewalks that they've closed. You know, it's really, it's an inconvenience for the students where they have to walk, they have to find new routes to walk. Uh, traffic is uh, another big problem. For the Department of Public Safety, however, campus construction means greater concerns about pedestrian safety. The Assistant Director for Transportation, Tim Saunders, tells is under The Assistant Director for Transportation, Tim Saunders, tells us more. We've got a couple of uh, pedestrian crossings up there that, because of the work, have been obliterated. And so those have to be restored, and we have to go back and check and make sure that the signing is, is put back up and correct. Though most students try to cut across designated walkways, Saunders suggests looking both ways before crossing the street and then walking on designated crosswalks. This will be the best way to avoid any type of risk or injury during the construction phases. While some students listen and heed this advice, others take risks that might not be worth it. In Chapel Hill, I'm Lauren Cox, Carolina Week. Saunders says the Department of Public Safety is trying to put up more countdown clocks at walkways across campus. He also welcomes any suggestions students might have. The first three floors of the parking deck at the new Rams Head Center are up. The center will also have a campus recreation building, a dining facility, and a small grocery store. Rams Head Center is six months behind schedule because of bad ground and bad weather conditions. Construction is scheduled to finish in January 2005. The Rams Head Center is just one part of Carolina's master plan. Students say other projects have changed their usual paths on campus since last spring. Renovation on Memorial Hall is forcing students to take a detour between Memorial, Phillips, and Carroll Halls. Construction on the new science complex at Venable Hall has students finding alternate paths between Polk Place, South Road, and the science labs. Meanwhile, renovations of Murphy Hall are finished, finally clearing the path between Lenore and Polk Place. Residents of the Gimgle Road Historic District will have new neighbors soon, a 500-space parking deck and a chiller plant. The town council gave university officials the go-ahead on the project in a 6-2 to two vote last week. The vote capped five months of negotiations between the university and town about changes to the university's development plan. Those opposed say the project will increase traffic and noise. They're also worried about construction so close to the old Chapel Hill Cemetery. If you take Highway 54 East out of Chapel Hill, you're in for several more weeks of backups. The North Carolina Department of Transportation closed eastbound ramps at I-40 and Highway 54 in mid-August. The closure is part of a 35-day construction project to widen I-40. Motorists have been advised to take alternate routes such as Highway 54 to NC-751, but these detours are causing serious backups and frustration. The project is scheduled to finish by <clears throat> mid-September. Wednesday is the first day that cameras will catch red light runners in Chapel Hill. Only two cameras are up right now. One is located at the intersection of Airport Road and Estes Drive. The other where US 15501 Sage Road and Scarlet Drive meet. Officials plan to install another eight cameras in the next few months. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety estimates that installed the cameras cost about $60,000 each. 
Notices of fines will start going out to drivers' homes next week. City officials expect to collect as much as $1,700 in fines a month. At that rate, it would take about 30 years for the cameras to pay for themselves. The stores on Franklin Street usually bring in big money for the town of Chapel Hill, but as reporter Amanda Yarusi tells us, it hasn't been business as usual lately. During the summer break, many stores along Franklin Street closed, leaving the doors wide open for new business. For Pita Pit owner Frank Ryan, Franklin Street was just the opportunity he needed. I was very excited about getting this location. That When I first came here, I could have gone anywhere in the Triangle. And my understanding is the university is planning on growing the student population significantly over the next five years. So that's why it was important for me to get one of the spots that were open on Franklin Street. As Ryan's store gets ready to open later this week, university favorites continue to close down. But these changes come as no surprise to Top of the Hill owner Scott Maitland. He's been around long enough to see it all. I think that actually what we're seeing now is just a small cycle and that Franklin Street as always will come back and we will, uh, the merchants will figure out ways to make it attractive to the community. For now, Ryan hopes his pita pit will be just what Franklin Street needs to help turn things around. I'm sure we're going to be successful. It, maybe there's a degree of how successful with some businesses uh, going under, but uh, college kids tend to eat regardless of good times or bad, and I think we're gonna get our fair share of business. Ryan's ready to make his mark on Franklin Street, and he knows he has Maitland's business to follow as a model. If there's one thing the rookie and the veteran already have in common, it's that they're in the business of feeding college students and the community. In Chapel Hill, I'm Amanda Yarusi, Carolina Week. Pita Pit opens Thursday and the Halloween Zone will move into the former WIMS location. Most students use summer break as a vacation, but one student's been working non-stop since April. We'll tell you what he's been doing when Carolina Week returns. There is really only one boy. One tree, one forest, one deep dancing ocean. One mountain calling, one handful of sand through our fingers, one endless sky overhead and one simple way to care for it all. Please visit earthshare.org and learn how the world's leading environmental groups are working together under one name, Earthshare. One environment, one simple way to care for it. For the third straight year, budget cuts have taken a toll on students here at UNC Chapel Hill. This year, not nearly as many students were able to get introductory Spanish classes in Dye Hall. State budget cuts forced the university to decrease the number of course sections offered. That means students might graduate later than expected. The drop in the number of classes offered is to offset UNC's budget loss of nearly $5 million. La late last month, the New York Times reported that 1,000 Carolina students wouldn't be able to take to getting Spanish. Will Milligan, a Spanish minor, says he's tried since freshman year to get intro Spanish. This fall, as a junior, he'll take his first Spanish class. Any English class I wanted to get in, I could probably almost definitely get in just by going up to the teacher and talking. I mean, we have a class now that there's probably like three people sitting on the floor, but they'll do it, you know, just to get in the class. So I don't understand why. I would have definitely sat on the floor my freshman year to get in Spanish one. Milligan says the budget cuts have affected his plans for graduation. Tune in next week as Carolina Week takes an in-depth look at the budget crisis and what it's costing you. U.S. News and World Report rankings of America's best college has UNC Chapel Hill as the fifth best public school in the nation. Tied for first are UC Berkeley and the University of Virginia, followed by the University of Michigan and UCLA at number four. The News Magazine also ranks UNC 29th overall among both private and public universities. UNC sophomore Derwin DeBose believes the rankings are valuable, but he says that what's more important is how the students feel about their school. As far as campus atmosphere, and U.S. News may say we're number five, but to me we're definitely number five. 
other North Carolina schools in the top 100 include Duke at number 5, Wake Forest ranked 28th, and NC State comes in at 84th. Out-of-state applicants to the UNC system might be in for a pleasant surprise next fall. The UNC system Board of Governors is debating whether or not to raise the cap for out-of-state students for all 16 campuses. The proposal would bring the current 18% cap up to 25%. Opponents say the increase would serve as a crutch to make up for budget cutbacks and that, and that it's just an, another effort to boost the system's magazine ranking. Supporters say the proposal would increase revenue from out-of-state tuition as well as diversify student bodies across the state. The search for a new vice chancellor for student affairs is nearing an end. The search committee in charge of finding a replacement for Dr. Melissa Exum invited three candidates to visit the campus last month. The three candidates are the Dean of Students at the University of Virginia, Dr. Penny Rue, the Dean of Students at Central Michigan University, Dr. Bruce Roscoe, and the Vice President for Student Development at the University of North Texas, Dr. Bonita Jacobs. The search committee will meet Thursday to decide which candidate to recommend to the Provost's office. School's just getting underway, but student body president Matt Tepper has been busy since he took office in April. Carolina Week's Dana Hackett has more. While many students were enjoying time away from campus this summer, student body president Matt Tepper was hard at work, continuing his duties as the new SBP. Weekly volunteer service at the Interfaith Council made up only part of Tepper's busy schedule. It turned out it was, it was a pretty crazy summer um, with budget cuts happening and different controversies popping up left and right. It turned out that we definitely were, were really, really busy in here. The first item of business, lobbying at the state capitol in June. Tepper says he tried to persuade legislators to maintain university funding while balancing the budget. But despite his efforts, major budget cuts and a tuition increase were inevitable. Increasing tuition constantly really hurts um, students' access to the university system. Tuition woes weren't Tepper's only main concern this summer. The university's summer reading book, Nickel and Dime, sparked controversy across campus. And at a summer press conference, Tepper stood up for the university's choice, claiming the book served its purpose. I think that the discussions that have come out of this are great. I think that's the whole point of the um, summer reading program, to really generate lots of discussion and get people really excited about reading a book. As he moves into the new school year, Tepper says he knows a lot is expected of him, and he plans to deliver his platform. Major tasks ahead include increasing voter registration on campus and addressing needs found on the student wish list. In Chapel Hill, I'm Dana Hackett, Carolina Week. Tepper is working to meet goals on his student wish list by the end of the month. Starting with the incoming freshman class of 2006, the swim test will no longer be a graduation requirement. Instead, students will have to take a one-hour lifetime fitness class, which will replace the current two-hour physical education requirement. Contrary to popular belief, the swim test was not created by a wealthy donor whose child drowned. The test actually began in the 1940s when UNC was used as a naval training site during World War II. So, the weather seems perfect for swimming. It has been. It's been very hot this summer, and we've had some dry conditions lately but we're not really sure if that's going to stay in our forecast for the next couple of days but hurricane fabian is the big news story and that doesn't look like it's going to be a problem right now but first uh, let's go to this week's weather question that is what is the estimated temperature of lightning is it 1000 5000 25000 or 50000 degrees fahrenheit i'll have the answer and this weekend's forecast just after the break by what they see adults do. Remember, a child may be watching you. How you doing? I just want a uh, regular, no sugar today. You got it. Thanks. Hello. Hi. Did you eat that whole thing today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Hi, how, how are you are doing? doing? She's getting big, huh? Big. Yeah, she is big. Let's go. Uh, hey, haircut. Yeah. yeah, looks cute. Come on, let's go. Nice to see you. Thanks a lot. If only child abuse were this easy to recognize. If you even suspect abuse, call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. All calls are anonymous and confidential. 
Trust your instincts. Hi, and welcome back to Carolina Week. It's been pretty normal for the first week of September with hot temperatures, and we've had a few scattered thunderstorms around the area, but it has been really nice to be outdoors. We've had uh, plenty of sunshine, so it's made it perfect just to bring your homework outside or even just have lunch with a friend or just read a newspaper. But the big weather story is Hurricane Fabian, and the question is, is that really going to be affecting us? Right now, the hurricane experts are predicting that Hurricane Fabian will be moving north. The winds for Hurricane Fabian have been 135 miles per hour. That was what was last checked, and gusts have even reached up to 165 miles per hour. So we definitely do not want this Category 4 hurricane hitting our coastline. But because of a jet stream that we have, the upper level winds will carry the hurricane away from our area. Right now, though, we do see a lot of clouds over the east coast. Yet it has been plenty dry over the west, and the Midwest really needs that. They've had a lot of flooding out in the Midwest, so they definitely need those dry conditions. And it looks like those dry conditions will be coming to our area for the weekend. If we look at our surface map, we can see what's causing all this. This low pressure system here, which is usually associated with rainy conditions, that's what's going to be bringing some clouds and scattered showers around our area. But the high pressure system, you can't really see it right up here, but it's up toward Canada. That's going to be pushing our way, and along with it, it could bring a cold front, which would be a nice relief from the hot temperatures that we've had, and it could bring the temperatures down a little bit below normal, and we wouldn't have as much humidity. If we look at our four-day forecast, we can see our temperatures are going to start off in the lower 80s, and it's going to warm up closer to the mid uh, 80s as we get closer to the beginning of the week. On Friday, we'll have cloudy conditions and a 50% chance of rain, so bring your umbrella just in case. And then on Saturday, the clouds will start to leave our area and the sun will be coming out and it looks pretty nice for the rest of the weekend. And the sun will be out plenty on Sunday and Monday with temperatures starting off in the lower 80s uh, and going into the mid 80s and lows will be in the lower 60s. If you're heading toward the beach, the beach will be nice. It will be cloudy though. And the question is if we could see some of the showers from Hurricane Fabian. Highs will be in the mid to lower 80s and lows will be around 70 degrees. It will be nice if you're a surfer, if you want to head down there this weekend, they will have larger waves due to Hurricane Fabian. If you're going to the mountains, it's going to be a little cooler down there, 78 and 79 on Sunday and plenty of sunshine, so it'll be really nice to be at the mountains and lows will be around 60 degrees. If you have problems with allergies, right now there's nothing that's going to be causing too much problems, but weeds are moderate, so keep that in mind if you do have uh, problems with allergies. But does anyone have an answer to our weather question? I'm going to go with D. I'll have to go with D as well. That's exactly right. D, 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So you definitely do not want to be in the way of lightning. And we've had plenty of uh, severe thunderstorms this summer, and you really got to watch that with sports such as baseball if you're going to be outdoors or just even playing golf. Yeah, you need to be careful with lightning when you're playing sports, that's for sure. Speaking of sports, there's nothing better than tailgate parties and competitive football. Too bad Chapel Hill was home to neither this weekend, and the Tar Heels faced Chris Ricks and the Florida State Seminoles. We'll see how welcome the Knolls were when we return. I love this place. You give blood and they take the platelets out and give the blood back to you. The hours are a bit strange, but I'm getting used to that. I come whenever I can, after all. Isn't it better to give blood to them than to you know who? <laughs> Just kidding. For more information on how you can donate, contact the UNC Blood Center. I think I'll give O negative today. Boy, that guy is weird. Good evening. Follow me, please. Imagine what America would be like today if Martin Luther King never had a dream. Help keep the dream alive. To find out more about the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, D.C., call or log on now.
Welcome back to Carolina Week. Looking to forget last season's 3-9 record with an 0-6 record at home, the North Carolina football team welcomed 13th-ranked Florida State to Keenan Stadium for its season opener on Saturday night. The Tar Heels come out pumped up for this one. They were looking to duplicate their 41-9 upset of the Seminoles from two years ago. However, Florida State running back Greg Jones didn't like all that talk about an upset. He takes the toss around the right side and scores to put the Seminoles up 7 to nothing. The Seminoles offense keeps clicking. Quarterback Chris Ricks back to pass and 43 yards later finds Willie Reed for a spectacular sports center catch at the UNC one yard line. From there, Ricks keeps it himself, jumping into the end zone for the touchdown. Florida State goes up 14 to nothing. The Tar Heel offense needs to respond, and it does, on this 15-yard pass play from Darian Durant to Jaworski Pollock. But even when, UN, even when UNC got within field goal range, kicker Dan Orner missed not one, but two field goals on the night. The Seminoles take advantage. Lorenzo Booker takes the pitch from Ricks and sprints 21 yards for the touchdown. 21-0 Florida State. I think we're seeing a pattern here, folks. Ricks adds another touchdown before the half, and this game has UNC fans headed for the exits. Florida State trounces UNC 37 to nothing. Despite the loss, however, Tar Heel players try to keep the season in perspective. Just, we got good guys on this team that um, good leadership on this team too. That we don't want to, you know, get down the dumps. You get down the dumps this early in the season, it's going to be a long season. You not imagine it's, it's, it's one game, man. Y'all looking at it like it's the end of the world, so it's one game. I mean, we lost 37 to nothing, yes. We have zero and one. That's it. The next game for the Tar Heels will be against Syracuse this Saturday at 1.30 in Keenan Stadium. Coach John Bunting will start freshman Ronnie McGill at running back for the Heels. It will be the first game of the year for the Orangemen. Syracuse was one of only three teams Carolina defeated last year. We'll see if the heels can bounce back after the Florida State debacle. After a historic finish in the Sweet 16 last December, Carolina volleyball players are starting this season with more than victory on their minds. They want total domination. Ranked 20th in the nation, the heels shut out their first three opponents 9-0 at the GlaxoSmithKline UNC Volleyball Classic. With 101 assists, number two sophomore Mackenzie Bird helped UNC beat visiting teams Oregon, James Madison, and Temple. But the star of the weekend was outside hitter Molly Piles. With 38 kills and 20 digs in three games, the UNC junior was named Most Valuable Player and received nominations for Carolina Waterscape's Student Athlete of the Week. The Tar Heels head south on Saturday, hoping to continue their winning streak against Michigan State and South Carolina in Columbia. Former UNC Tar Heel Eric Montross is retiring after eight seasons in the NBA because of a lingering foot injury. Montross led the Heels to their third national championship in 1993. He averaged four points and five rebounds for six different NBA teams, finishing up with the Toronto Raptors. His jersey still hangs in the Raptors at Smith Center. Well, guys, we won our last national championship 10 years ago with Montross. Hopefully, we can continue that trend this year. Yes, I hope so. And some giant puppets on campus aren't visiting from Sesame Street. But they still have a lesson to teach. Find out what when Carolina Week returns. When your children ask where you got married, will you have to tell them over there by the unleaded? When we lose a historic place, we lose a part of who we are. Help protect historic places in your community. Visit nationaltrust.org. If you have a story idea, contact Carolina Week at 843-8292. You can also visit us online at carolinaweek.org. If you have questions about this program, write Carolina Week at Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 
see what a 10% weight loss can do for you. Celiac disease affects one out of every 250 Americans. These individuals can't eat any product con containing gluten, one of the primary ingredients found in most bread products. Adam Geller reports about one local, lo local baker who's baking to a different wheat. At first glance, it looks like a normal day in the Whole Foods Bakery as employees mix, <laughs> knead, butter, and bake lots of bread. Today, though, is gluten-free day in the bakery. Lee Tobin, or as many call him, Glute-Free Lee, has spent the last five years baking breads that celiac patients can eat. Glute-Free Lee understands how hard it can be to live with celiac disease. He himself was diagnosed in 1996. It's, it changes your life immediately because uh, it changes your diet, and that is that is your life, especially when you're working as a chef. Um, uh, I was... I was more fortunate than most because I had an understanding of food and you really need to learn what's in the food that you're eating uh, when you go on the diet because you have to be very careful. So careful that Tobin actually moves the regular flour outside the kitchen on Tuesdays. When the baked goods hit the shelves on Wednesdays, people stop by and ask if they still taste great. My vote is even better. Customers seem to agree. And this is the greatest thing that's we've encountered since they were diagnosed. It has been a lifesaver for us at least. And then you find this and it's just makes it a lot easier. Knowing he is able to help other people with gluten intolerance is what drives Tobin. I have parents who bring their kids in and they hold them up to the counter and say, this is the, this is the man who baked your cake. And it's just, it breaks my heart to see that and it really, it motivates me to keep keep trying to come up with new products. With all these good things to eat, Tobin offers one warning. Uh, there's the danger of over consuming. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get some of the gluten free baked goods, you'd better not wait. Most of it sells out by Friday. In Chapel Hill, I'm Adam Geller, Carolina Week. In case you can't make it to the store before the shelves are clear, you can call Whole Foods to place a special order at 968-1983. Cardboard animals and giant puppets are taking the stage at the Forest Theater in Chapel Hill. Paper Hand Puppet Intervention uses music and dancing to educate the community about social justice. Some puppeteers mounted stills to portray mobs. Other man's giant five-person puppet. Director Jan Berger, who plays a bluebird, says puppets are a great way to reach children of all ages. I think that when we're kids, we have this, this time where the world is new and we don't know what's real and what's not real. And there's a part of us when we become adults that still has that in us. So that if you see an animal or a person that's a giant puppet, and you, you let yourself be fooled by it, even though intellectually you know that there's somebody in there operating it. The production of The Dream and The Lie will run September 4th through September 7th and again on the 11th and 14th. Did you happen to make it to that puppet production? Not yet, Courtney, but I'm looking forward to seeing it. How about yourself? Seems pretty interesting. Wish I could have checked it out. Yep. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to catch the Monday edition of Carolina Week starting next week. Thanks for watching. Good night.